So we're in the last hour now. We've got, you know, a lot of the support staff over here where we've got, you know, cinnamon dust or nutmeg dust, or here's critter ritter, which is just black pepper. But boy, it's ripe. You can throw that down in a crawl space and you choke it out. Slug magic, which is just nothing but iron phosphate, 4% iron phosphate, kills slugs like crazy. Works great, doesn't hurt anything else. This stuff, when the slug eats it, the slug starts to feel bad and the slug has a hideout. So the slug goes back to the hideout and dies. Well, there's other slugs back in the hideout and they go, hey, Bob's dead. Let's eat him. So they eat Bob, then they die. So is that the same as sluggle? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, what is it? 1% iron phosphate, okay. Because the regular iron phosphate's 4%, so this is 1%. So you've got that, here's another slug magic. You know, here's a yellow jacket trap, if you have a problem like that. Normally that's a beneficial, but sometimes those stinging beneficials, I don't mind if they're in their garden, but I want their nest next to my door. Let's put it that way. I don't want it where somebody's gonna get hurt, or you know, my neighbor's kid's gonna come over and play on the swing set, and there's a yellow jacket nest right at the bottom of the swing set. You, know, you wanna learn how to see those nests? so that you don't have the bad surprise and you're gonna look for those bee lines. You're gonna look for continual like things just shooting out, like very directed shooting out of that hole. That's what's gonna tell you where a hole is. And if you just kind of relax into it and get, let your gaze just kind of be generalist, you'll spot them. And then you won't step on them, which is a whole lot better. These are little geeky things that you can get. You know what I mean, here's a little net. I used to make nets like this out of hosiery. You know, I just go buy a couple pair of hose, clear hose, make my own net. A lot of this you can do and it doesn't cost you hardly anything, right? You can go out, you can buy tree tangle foot, and this is really good. You can probably get some Vaseline and it worked just about almost the same. Well, this is for outdoor use, you know what I mean? So there's a lot of supporting stuff. I've got a lot of cards out here with just different beneficials and, and insects on it. If there's any kind of general questions that you guys have that we haven't covered today, because this is, you know, a tremendous amount of stuff to, I mean, this is like define the universe and give two examples, right? Is there something on the website that says um, what to plant where and how close? What to plant next to what? And I don't have companion plant stuff in there yet, but I do have you know, all the spring plants together. Okay. So I can, you can look at I have at a, a 50 by 70 foot plot, and I have, um, on the outside of the fence, I put right. two feet of flowering. Nets. Right. Um, is that going to take care of everything inside? Because you're saying that some of it needs to be... Okay, well here, then, then the question becomes, which beneficial is it? Because if it's a low or medium dispersing beneficial, you have to be, you have to get it really close, right. If it's medium or high, when I was doing Christmas trees, all we had to do to keep Christmas trees with surfing flies is we could just have a little plot of false dandelion up in the corner. And those things would go up there and then they'd come back out into these trees and go back out. And you know what I mean? Is it, they, they would go. So as long as there was food there, it didn't matter where because they, the distance was nothing to them. So somewhere on here it tells me how far I need to put something, whether this is a six incher or... Well, what, what it would be is if you look at that farmscaping handout, I have those tables where I have low dispersion, medium dispersion, and high dispersion. But most times you're going to want to have farmscaping for all different dispersions. Sure. So you're going to want to have some stuff that's close together. Something for beets, I should put them right next to beets because whatever's going to go after a beet is right. not going to be... A right. Well, what, here's what I would say is if you're going to use something that's going to go after aphids, let's just take aphids and ladybugs, you're going to want to have that farmscaping within 20 to 30 feet of where that is because you want those ladybugs to know that their food is just a little short hop away or their reproductive food. They can live and survive and eat pollen and nectar, but then the money the money is the larva, right? I mean, that's what we want. So when the other thing that we would do, you know, when I was releasing all those ladybugs down at Jules, we could come back that afternoon because I had pre-sprayed with sugar water and it was a little bit wet. I put them out in the morning, come back in the afternoon, they're mating. 
that's a good sign because of what it means. You know what I mean? They're going to take the time to invest now. They're going to invest their progeny in that area, and they're telling me that they're going to do it. Yeah. And, if and I don't the, see that, the, the and I larva see don't fly them. away. You know, right. they're stuck. If I see them running around and I look out and I see them flying out of the field, I'm like, oh, this is just there's something wrong here that I don't understand. Or when I'm working with Christmas trees, one of these, this was at Glass Mountain, Glassy Mountain, okay? They got a Christmas tree farm at the base of Glassy Mountain. They're overrun with spruce spider mite every year. I said, you need to get rid of this mountain. Because <laughs> what's happening, all these mites, if you guys ever been in a football stadium in the fall when there's... Uh, or even in the spring when it gets uh, pollen in it, you'll get all those little velvet mites in there all over the place. And mites love rocky stuff like that. So I'm there and I'm just looking at this lady. I'm like, you, you know, because here's Glassy Mountain. It's just this big round dome. You know, it's like Stone Mountain up in Wilkes County. I'm like, I am sorry. What you ought to do is cut these trees down and go with something that doesn't get mites. Because either that or start raising predatory, sell mites. You could sell mites to Carolina Biological Supply for more than what your Christmas trees are worth. You know what I mean? And, and that's another thing. Uh, it's almost that capitalistic entrepreneur thing where every once in a while you might have to, you know, turn your disadvantage into an advantage. You know what I mean? Is if, 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 if you can't do one thing, there's a whole biological world out there that may buy the bugs that you have now because you can get out on the internet and contact Carolina Biological Supply and say, I got hundreds of Colorado potato beetles. They say, oh, you know what? We'll give you a dollar a beetle. You, you, put, you pick them, put them in 70% ethanol, send them to me. You send me 500 beetles, I send you $500. Guess what? That was worth more than your potatoes would ever been worth. Now, I'm not saying that you know, everybody can do that, and it's you know, that kind of Mr. Haney you know, entrepreneurship, but that's always been part of what we have done, which is when we started doing farmscaping, we didn't even think about it being edible, and then all of a sudden it was like, hey, we can do, I can do a pickle mix for my, for my cucumbers, and I've got garlic, and I've got dill, and I've got, if I want some fennel, I got fennel, and I got grape, you know what I mean? I, not, I may not have all of my pickling spices, but I got everything else that's going to go in there, and that's my farmscape mix that kept everything going in the first place. Or I can let my brassicas finish out and flower, you know, and it means that I don't have to rush to get my farmscaping in. The plants are ready to put out now. By the time we get them in, the last of the brassicas will be just about finished flowering, and we'll have a continuous farmscaping. You know? Meanwhile, we eat a whole lot of those flowers before they open. You know, they get ahead of us, they get to stay open and bloom, and it's just like this ongoing thing of every stage of that plant is valuable to us. You so know? what is next after the brassicas here? It's going to be um, bachelor buttons and calendula. Right. Um, it'll be buckwheat and cilantro. Um, there's, a few, there's a few parsley plants in there, here and there, that are going to start going to seed. You know? um, and actually, I'm behind on it, but I'm, I've got some flower and alliums I want to put in there. You know? And they're supposed to come on if I have them in in time, which will be next year. This year it's not going to work because I didn't get them in soon enough. But they'll be blooming sometime about the middle of May. You know? So it'll just be this continuing succession. And of course, the cover crops are going to be blooming. You know, I mean, the grains, no nectar, but lots of pollen, plenty of pollen, and they'll be feeding on that, you know. They'll be feeding on the aphids that are there, you know, the aphids are going to be in the peas, you know, it's just this continual succession, it's this world of life, lot, all kinds of parts are edible. Meanwhile, what do we have in our salad today? Pea shoots, where'd they come from? Cover crops, you know. I mean, there's just like one, <laughs> there's all these things, all these different ways to use the same things, you know, and it's like... Really, the longer I do it, the more I'm kind of disappointed if I haven't thought of like three other uses for my farmscaping, you know? Like, because they are, they're herbs. I mean, oats, right? They're, you know, they're cover crop. You can harvest them in the milky stage and make a tincture that's really good for you, you know, for all kinds of purposes. When they finish aureus and sidiosis and all kinds of things, love them. Before they get to that stage, when they're in the, the pollinating stage, there's tons of pollen for the, pollen for the beneficials. 
So you have all these different things, you know, and then when they're all done, you roll them down and it's your very high carbon mulch that's armoring your soil for the next time around. You know, so you just keep getting value. And he would roll it down like at Highland Lake Inn and you would watch all these, you know, it dry it out. He'd dry out and all the beneficials just move right out and everything right. else. And he'd roll it down like, you're blowing my, you, this is too much. I can only take small portions of this and I got to go back to Raleigh and enter the real chemical world. With my I had no idea that these grains were going to be covered up with beneficial insects. Because you tend to think of grains as like, well, they don't feed benefit, but they sure as heck do, you know? And then to be that guy or herb, it's like huge numbers of, whoa, I just paid $80 for 500 of you. Yeah, know? right. We're finding them in the window going, oh my God. Yeah, could... yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, there are, all these things have so many different benefits. You know, you can use them so many different ways, you know? Um, and I keep learning new ways all the time, you know? I mean, cilantro, yeah, it can flower. You can use the green coriander. It makes curry really wonderful, you know? Turns out if you want, if, the, if you're doing an authentic tie, you take the whole plant and blend it up, roots and all, you know? And so you've got all those uses, plus it's a beneficial insect plant, you know? And it just keeps happening that way. And so you, you pretty soon get pretty excited about the fact that it, it's not like, oh, the burden of putting your diversity in. It's like the adventure of putting your diversity in, you know? Um, and well, we've gone from where we used to do prescription chemistry. That's what I was originally taught. I was, re you know, I was schooled in, I have a degree in integrated pest management that was basically, that's what it was. It was prescription chemistry. But me being out in the field and being out there, I'm like, why am I waiting for these pests? You know what? Look what the Chinese just did. They just took 60,000 people in their army and they made a tree army. These guys do nothing but go around and plant trees. Now, I don't know whether they're doing them good, because I've seen where they plant out west of Beijing, and it's just out in the desert, but they're supposed to plant. You know what I mean? Because, they're, you know, comrade, you've been given a 1,000 trees. You're going to put them in the ground by the end of this month, right? So it's like, he didn't care where he put them. But a lot of them do it right, because a lot of them have been to this country now and seen the incredible resources that we have that they used to have that 500 years ago they cut everything down and they've just been sitting around with no trees forever you know when i went over in 92 the one thing that they did with our group at the very end of every group of people that we met was said what is one tell us one thing that we should do and i said plant some blanking trees and I think that sunk into them. And then the other thing that sunk into them was solar energy. Because they made the price of solar go from $5 a watt down to 50 cents a watt, down to 30 cents, down to almost 10 cents. You can find some solar panels that are 10 cents a watt. When I bought my panels in 1999, I paid $4.86 a watt. So for an 80 watt panel, I'm paying five, just a little less than 500 bucks. I just paid 20 cents a lot. See, that's just, I want to take my panel and hit him over the head with it. Just bang, bust it through. But you've been doing it all this time. I've been doing it. Okay, so what I did is I took my, you know, when I left the NCDA, I thought Y2K, I was a big Y2K nut back in the day. But I just, I said, this is also an opportunity for me to stand behind what it is that I believe in. And I'm going to get these panels, and these, either these panels are going to be good, and it's going to work for me, or I'm going to say I was a stupid idealistic hippie that didn't know one end of his body from the other. Well, right off the bat, we put those things in. On a day like today, I'm not on the system. I'm just sitting there making, and I can, I can store up some. I can store up probably 20 to 40 amp hours, which will last me into the evening a little bit. But the nice thing is I would save all my dirty clothes and everything for daylight. Today's the day we're going to do wash, we're going to vacuum, we're going to get everything all done. So it makes it really nice. And the other thing is if you have solar hot water, when are you going to come in? When you come in the evening, that hot water is ready for you just right then. So all that stuff starts to fit together <clears throat> and becomes part of this whole sustainable thing where it's just not the bugs, but it's you know soft energy, farmscaping. It's, all this, it's what we call soft power. Right, it's that soft power. It's not hard power. We're not going out with DDT anymore, or, or you know, when I'm transitioning a lot of these tobacco growers, they're going to me. 
boy, it's hard for me to go out and not spray and just not, you know, I want to see stuff just dropping. You know what I mean? Because they're used to that. You know, they want to walk behind something and they want to just see the worms falling off these plants. All right. So B BT, you know what I mean? It's like, you got to wait two days. Come here and look at this caterpillar that's puked its guts out. You know what I mean? So Our um, main spray person is Marshall. Marshall had been a commercial farmer, and he was focused on compost tea yet. He got it all figured out. He came to me the one spring and said, I'm ready to figure out the bugs. Show me what I need to spray the bugs. I know I, gotta, I should be spraying bugs. And I said, well, let's walk around and see. And I looked, and I looked here, and I looked there, and I couldn't find anything that needed to be sprayed. I said, a little later, we'll spray for vine borer, because that's, you can count on it. There's nothing we can do about it. We got to spray for it, you know? But it's too early. There's nothing to spray for. And he's like, that's insane. That's insane. That's insane. You don't have to spray for anything? You know? <laughs> like, yeah. Of course you have to spray for something. I was just so amazed at these rows and rows of all these different chemicals. And I'm just like, my God, what are we doing? You know, it's just unbelievable. This warehouse was just full of all these. I made a scene in a place one time. I was like, you have chickweed killer? <laughs> my God, you have chickweed killer? Why don't you just eat it? You know? <laughs> A specific poison just to kill chickweed. <laughs> I've got water in the, in the landscaping. Yeah, okay. Cup plant. There's several plants that will hold water. This is one of his big ones that, that he and I, and this is another one that Brinkley, back, this is back in Virginia Tech with Ron Morse. I started scouting corn in, the early, in 1981, and there, was a, and there was a guy, Ron Morse, was doing no-till conventional. Well, then he got into organic, started doing no-till organic. He came to me and he's like, man, I wish I could get my career back because this is so exciting now because it's synergistic. You know what I mean? One and one and two. It, when you put farmscaping together with no-till, one and one is eight. I have lots of cup plants, right? I can give anybody that wants seed, right? Um, and so I'm promoting it because this is wonderful. It flowers for, what, about six weeks? Oh, yeah, Abundant, good. like small sunflowers, you know, it's in the, it's in the Asteraceae family. Just gorgeous, big, huge plant, right? And it's got these little places where there's water for the, for the insects all the time. They never go thirsty, right? And then I start looking it up. Oh, it's a wonderful forage plant. Great for livestock. Very, very highly palatable, pretty high protein, 20-some percent protein. Great for it. You know, so then we should be planting in the pastures. You know, you want those kind of, because it's deep-rooted, it's going to be making that pasture have, you know, and it's also going to be a big bunch of food when maybe they're, and you can just decide when you let them eat it, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I look a little further, and oh, the American Indians collected the resin and used it for nausea. And then they used another part to, eat, to help women with their menstrual flow. I forget if it was to stop it or start it, but they, they had that purpose, you know. And then I look more further, and it's like they ate the greens in the springtime. And so this plant is like all these different uses. We started out just because it was a plant that had water for, you know. And is it something we see in, out in fields? The, no, it's, it's, it, I don't think it's very common around here. Mm -hmm. It is native to the entire Northeast. Mm -hmm. If you do see it, it'll be in a wet area. That's the other right. thing. It can take 15 day, up to 15 days submerged, and it'll be fine. So we've we got a whole bunch of it. We're going to plant them along the uphill side of our swales. And they'll be there, they'll be like, you know, filtering, even slowing down the water even more as it makes its way into the, into the swale. And they may decide to grow down into the swale, which is going to be fine by us. They'll open up the soil and more water will go into the aquifer and we'll have less in the pond, but where we really want it is in the aquifer. So it's just like many, many uses for this thing. And I've seen it, I've seen it and relatives of it native in other places. But it is, it is native to the entire Northeast. And I can admit that um, there's some wildflower people up in New England that think that even though it's native, it's too rambunctious. You know, I mean, once it gets going, first it spreads by seeds, then it spreads by runners, you know? What, what I say to that is, pardon? What color is it? It's, it's a wonderful green, you know, kind of deep green. It's down there now. You know, it's like just coming up now is when you'd be cutting it for food. And I tried it for the first time, and it's, it's kind of bitter. But it's kind of bitter in a way that I like. You know, I, I like bitter, you know, it's, it's bitter like escrow. It's not bitter like, you know, the wrong kind of creasy green. You know, the light green, creasy green that you had in the salad today, that one's edible. The dark green one, ooh-wee, you know. 
<laughs> It'll really get you, you know, but this one here. Well, he stir fries a lot of his bitter greens. That, so that helps. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, would you put an actual water feature in, a pond or anything? Or you could do that. You could water? do that, yeah, because you would get dragonflies. Another, another moisture plant are your jewel weeds or your touch-me-nots, both the lowland and the highland. So, if you're putting the pond and you want some motion, yeah. you know? But I use those in certain areas, and they make them really wet, you know, because in the morning, all that jewelweed, at the, at the tip of each point of the leaf, there's just water droplets. It's, in fact, the whole thing's just juicy. So it's one that will help hold. If you want something, so my cove faces southwest, so it gets really super hot sun strike. So I planted a whole bunch of jewelweed, and in, I've got blueberries, the Japanese beetles will leave the blueberries to eat the jewelweed, right? I mean, they're sitting like this, and they're eating the jewelweed and not eating my blueberries. I'm like, boy, that's, that's a good trap crop. I have thousands of uh, jewelweed. Mm -hmm. It just covers the whole creek. Side, yeah. You know, and it's, it's amazing. My wife, uh, we have a, she got a yard guy to come up one day, and, of course, he nuked, I had this gorgeous thing of jewelweed all around our parking area, and it was all this tall, it was just beautiful. He comes in and weeds eat it all down. Well, first, of course, I wanted to shoot him. Well, then I watched what happened. None of that jewelweed came back. What came back was urtica. I don't know how it got in there, but you know what I mean? It was like the two yin-yangs. So when you whacked it, Mother Nature said, I'm gonna put stuff out here that it hits you. You punch me, I'm gonna punch you. You know, and that's actually what happens. If you think about it, yeah. if, we, if we're going to up the ante with Mother Nature, she's always going to win because yeah. yeah. she gets to play the last game every time. And she's got so many cards, you know, there's so many cards. In well, what I did then was I just went down and took, took my, you know, my high-tech aerial net here. I took all of my other nets I forgot and I didn't have any and I kept wondering what happened to them. I thought I, somebody stole them and then I remembered I took them all down to Jamaica <laughs> and left them down there for those guys because they need them. But you could take something like this and I would just go out with the jewelweed when it's popping, you know what I mean, and go like this and you just got all those little cool little speckled almond looking seeds kind of, you know what I mean, and go out where I want them and put them back and got them back again. And do the same thing with yarrow. Yarrow's really easy, you know, when it's, when it's browned out and the heads are browned out, you can just take those heads and just crumble them into a Ziploc bag and then just go take them where you want them and sprinkle them around. And that's another one of the ones that we keep learning uses for. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. you know, it's wonderful for beneficial insects. It's a perfect plant for the predator wasps to overwinter under all those layers, all those fractals, you know. Mm -hmm. It was used in, pre in previous times for, for brewing beer as a seasoning had a different effect, not the, the make you sleepy effect, but to make you exhilarated effect instead. Um, mm -hmm. The monks didn't much like that, you know. Um, <laughs> and it's also pretty much antiviral. So you can use it as a medicine that way. And if you cut yourself really bad, the old English name for yarrow is spear heel. I've had cuts, that, you know, it's spurting blood and it's throbbing. I, put, I chew that up to get the active ingredient active and put it on there and it stops throbbing, it stops bleeding, take a blade of grass and tie it on there. By the next day, that wicked cut is all closed up. It's kind of ugly because there's a little bit of yarrow in there, but that's okay, it works itself out, you know. No problem, you know. We haven't talked about grasshoppers at all. Okay, grasshoppers, uh, there's a product called Nosema locusta in its actual protozoa and they call it NOLO, N-O-L-O, no locus. Now, here's a trick with that. It's a microsporidian, so it's debilitating and not lethal. So what happens is if you get Nosema going out with your crickets and grasshoppers, it causes them to lay maybe something like 80% less eggs. They're still going to be there, but they're going to be sick, diseased individuals. One of the other things that we used to do, and I don't know if you've got enough grasshoppers to do this, but back in the 70s when we were growing those funny tomato plants, we'd collect our, our grasshoppers and put them in a blender and blend them with soap and then spray them back out. And let me tell you, the grasshoppers did not like that. I read that in Mother Earth News, you know what I mean? Is put, I, I remember hearing something about that. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can, that's kind of like a public health disaster for grasshoppers, you yeah. know? <laughs> Their health department is like really freaking out. Now, the other thing, blister beetles are parasitic on grasshoppers. But I don't know that a blister beetle is the cure for grasshoppers. I wouldn't try to encourage a lot of blister beetles right. anyway. You know? Right, because blister beetles eat grasshopper eggs. That's the larvae of them or planidia. The, the blister beetles can tell where these grasshoppers have laid eggs and they lay a larva and that larva is a planidia. So it's a act, real active larva and it goes down and it goes down into the grasshopper eggs and then it molts into a grub. It's a weirdest, you know, I mean, it has hypermetamorphosis where it takes, every stage is a different, it looks different. It, you know, how cool is nature, right? Oh, nature's amazing. Oh, and one that... What kind of damage do they do? You're saying, don't, you don't really want many. What do they do? The big problem with blister beetles is if you decide you don't like them and you go to scra grab them or crush them or something, they blister you. Yeah, they have cantharidin. Yeah, so you don't want to mess with them. You know, if you want to get rid of them, there's various stories of people chasing them with a smoking, you know... Broom. Paper. Yeah, they light a broom on fire. Yeah, you don't really want to get into it with them. You're going to lose, you know. So because typically in the old days, when uh, like the, in Missouri down the Boot Hill, when we were growing stuff, there'd be swarms of blister beetles. So all you wanted to do, you didn't want to kill them. You would light, you'd take a broom or something and light them, and then they'd fly over to your neighbors, and you're done. <laughs> and then all because all you want to do is get it. So then. You didn't want them to know because then they would try to be shoving it back your way and then they get people get in fights and they're fighting over blister beetles. How about that? Smoke, smoke wars. Yep, yeah. right, exactly. <laughs> this reminds me, one that we haven't mentioned is, you can kind of tell, and I learned this from Vic, um, if you're going to have a, a more of a presence of Japanese beetles or less of a presence based on what August is like, right? Yeah, July and August because that's when they're laying their eggs. Right. If so, you have wet... July, which up here, July is like the wettest month of our year, if you think about it. Yeah. So Japanese beetle is always going to do good. But if it's a really dry year, like 2016, you're not likely to see a lot of Japanese beetles because there's too much work for the Japanese beetles to get and they can't get enough, enough eggs in the ground because the ground is hard as a rock. And the other thing is when they lay an egg, that egg has to absorb water from the surroundings. So if they lay an egg and there's a drought, after a couple of days, that egg just dies because it didn't absorb the water that it needed. Normally, you know, it just absorbs atmospheric water, rainwater, or whatever. So this will be a really interesting year because the Midwest thinks that the cold winter... Kill them. Yeah, they're underground. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. They're That's sad. how you do your test by digging in the ground and figuring out how many yes. worms you have yes. or larva. Right. Yep. And uh, that's how we do it. And we, then you buy your wasps based on that. Right. That thing. Back in the day, and this is actually um, I have this on a, a guide sheet. Um, the USDA found out that if you have Six grubs per square foot, you get 60% or more parasitization of those grubs. If it gets down lower, you know, the thing goes down. But the whole, the real crux with Japanese beetles are those tiffia wasps and the istiquita. If those things have their food plants, you don't have them around. But I could go down the road even in Sugar Grove. I have, I have areas where I've got winsome fly where I am, and it's real low beetles. And you get down a little further, and here is this big cow pasture. And if I put a Japanese beetle trap down there, I can fill it in about a day and a half, you know, where it's got 3,500 beetles, and none of them have a parasite on them because there's no food plants in that area. And that's the area that's causing everybody problems because a Japanese beetle can fly five miles. In a you know what I mean? As it, it comes out, there's nothing around here. Guess what? I'm gone. Which means it's kind of hard to control them because somebody's got a bunch of turf, but they're doing nothing about them. Right. If they're in your, so what you want to do is find out where that area is. So what's happened with me now is the city of Portland, Oregon, has a massive outbreak of Japanese beetles, way out ahead of the front. So Oregon Department of Ag has got, you know, they went back and looked at this stuff, and they're like, hey, you work with Japanese beetle parasites. And I'm like, yeah, I'm about the only guy that's alive. You know, all the old guys are in the 20s and 30s. They've been dead for, for years. 
So we had to relearn all this. I had to reread all their old stuff. I went back to China, and I went back to Japan, and I tromped around just like them. And I know this stuff now. So when we have a conference call, Mike Klein, who's Mr. Japanese Beetle that retired from OARDC, but we're in on this conference call with the folks from California, and they're like, well, why, you know, why is this so important? And this is really nice. And I, I mean, Mike Klein goes, I'm the only guy that's alive under 100 years of age that has successfully moved both the spring tiffy and the winsome fly and knows how to do it. So that's the kind of knowledge here that I want to give you guys because we all know a lot of this stuff is time sense. You know what I mean? Is you, if you're going to work this season, you need to start now with this stuff. Or you can wait a year, you know, and watch everybody get destroyed or whatever. Did I not read on your website about Pierre Stepanka's being an early food source for that loss? Um, it could be, yeah. Because they're an early bloomer. Yes. And so I put out like six or seven right. Pierre Stepanka's. They're good, and, and, right. Uh, right. I, I have very little Japanese people. Tulip poplar. Mm -hmm. Peonies, anything with extra floral nectaries, bachelor buttons, peach trees, willow trees. But none Ooh. of these, even the peonies, don't need to be close, mm -hmm. right? Because these are six mile flyers. No. Tiffia wasps will fly maybe 300 feet, oh, okay. even though they're big. I mean, this is just their behavior. If there's food around and they got grubs, they're just going to stay right in that area, but they will knock the they will just parasitize the heck out of the grubs that are in that area. So that's what's really important about so it. So actually better to have it planted all over. Exactly. That's why I keep saying little clumps spread out is way better because a lot of these insects, even these big tiffia, now it, it could easily fly five miles if it needed to, but it doesn't want to, and you don't have to have it. And so that, that's the other thing with the ladybugs. All these little ladybugs we're looking at, guess what? If, if conditions are bad, they're gone. But in my field, you could give them a number, and they're still, you come back the next day, he's still there. You come back two months now, he's still there, she or she. You know what I mean? Because we've made a system that they don't want to leave. They, re, they have everything they need in that system. They've got their food. They've got an overwintering site. They have a steward that understands that that's what they need. They're going to be there. So that's when, you know, when we say build it, and they will come, most of this is just if you create the space for these things to come into, they will come into it. So think in terms of if, if you have to make those kinds of decisions, think of what you're worth an hour, what your product's worth, what the economic injury level is what the action threshold would be for something. So for example, you know, once again, if I go back to my broccoli example, when my broccoli is getting ready to head, that's when I go nuts. Up until then, I can let it get torn up. It looks terrible. You know, half the leaves are, are missing. But then I hit it with this stuff, and these abused plants yield more than your nice, pretty show plants that have never had any stress in their life. So that's one of the other things that we learned from research was when we would actually purposely defoliate plants. You know, we'd take a broccoli plant, do 50% defoliation, we just take half of the leaf off. Those plants had higher yields on them, up to 50% had higher yields than our normal plants. So the first year we did that, we're like, somebody's cutting these stalks wrong, right? So that was the spring thing. So then we're getting another set of data in the fall. So that data comes in, it matches the other one exactly, where, you know, the more damage you got it up to 50%, and then all of a sudden it drops off, and it's like, there's something going on here. We, do, we don't want our plants to be perfectly picture perfect, if possible. We want them to have just a tiny bit of this and that. That way they get those antioxidants. They've been challenged. It's just like all of us. If I was left to my own devices, I would be 500 pound fat guy that never left his room. But, but you know what I mean is here we are. And so part of this, 
You know, when I would call my grandpa up and I would say things to him, I'm going, I'm having a really hard time and I'm struggling. And he said, you know, that just sounds great to me. You know, and I'm like, that's not what I wanted to hear, Grandpa. <laughs> you know, he's like, those are good problems. Good for you. You know what I mean? I'm like, good for me? What the heck are you? I want you to say, help me solve my problems. He's like, no, you need those problems. You know what I mean? And I'm looking at him. I'm going, you and I aren't even talking on the same wavelength here. I want to remove my problems. He's like, problems are a fact of life, boy. You know? What so, you learn right. from them problems, right. you know? And those plants that are stressed, they are going to put their energy into making sure that they survive. And why do they want to survive? To reproduce. So what are they going to put a lot of energy into? <laughs> I mean, their food, right. Yeah. That's the way it happens. The more you stress Our organisms, food. the more they want to reproduce. You know, it just happens throughout the natural world you know with humans too the more you attack it the more it's going to reproduce it will die or it will super survive right it will die or it will super survive right yeah that's exactly what's going to happen you know it's just going to keep doing that you know that's the nature of it and so basically we just want to work with that rather than trying to you know take all of our energy to coddle them you know, the more you coddle them, the weaker they are, the less, you know, less able they are to take care of themselves and the less all the systems that would take care of them can do it because you've removed the need for them. If you take away the need for everything that makes sure that it all works, then you're in charge. It's all your job. You got to do it all. And that's a big load. You know, that's a lot harder than going, it's pretty much okay. I just got to watch it. Maybe I got to do a little something here, a little something there, but mostly... It's working, you know. That's a that's a way more comfortable place, you know. I'd it, say that's true, except for fruit. <laughs> fruit is harder, yeah. And so part of you know one of the raps from people is we need to be growing more seed fruit and adapting it more, you know. Well, my, and my best plants are uh, gummy berries, carnelian cherry. Mm -hmm. I don't do anything to them. Mm -hmm. it produce a ton. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. And king cherries, and I don't touch it, and you get these beautiful cherries where I have a, a marancy, and half the time I've had uh, brown rot, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, why am I growing these? I should put more goobies in. Right, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, well, and... Well, I would love to have some marancies, but... <laughs> we, get the, we get the apple pulp from Bold Rock, and use it for various reasons, and Jeremy's going, you know, there's this corner where the bunch of pumpkins pulp fell and there's like just like hundreds of little baby apple trees. I said, we should plant them out on the edges. We just plant them around and see what they do. See what, see what the genetic roll of the dice is, you know? And if we don't like them, then we graft on the most resistant right. apples we have. Yeah. But that's kind of a gift. It's kind of a message. It's like, you know, I was at Southern Sog and this guy was doing apples. He said, what I'm doing with apples is I'm growing all my apples from seed. You know, I'm about the next wave of apples. Right. That's how you're going to get it. And indeed, we had, you were, I think you were here for it when Craig Siska was talking about, you know, the biggest issue for Alan Chadwick was we have to stop relying so much on clones. Yeah. You know, I mean, clones are great. I mean, I'm, I don't, I'm going to do a whole lot of grafting yeah. later on this, you know, la later on this, this month, you know, um, or early in the next month. And they're great, but you also want to be doing the development of genetic, genetic diversity and paying attention and selecting. And so that's why we had Nate Kleiman down, you know, and he, he brought, like, you know, rhubarb seed. And it was a big deal because none of these rhubarbs had gone to seed for years and years and years. That's exactly the rhubarb I want to grow. I am so sick of my from seed, you know, Victoria rhubarb or whatever it is going to seed all spring long. You know, and all that energy is going to seed, yeah, right. and that's Making not what I want. Start, right. You know, so he said, well, okay, but, you know, you're not going to get that what we have. You're going to get the whole mix, and now you've got to select it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. You know, I'm ready for those adventures. It's time to start doing that, you know. And some people aren't, and so it's just people are in different places in their lives. To me, that's exciting now. Somebody else is just, I want the exact rhubarb that's going to work great, so they've got to get a clone from him, you know, and they're not going to be working towards that diversity, you know. I might find that there's other values to that rhubarb. It's more tolerant of temperature swings, which is what's going to be happening. 
it takes more intense range. You know, we're getting, we're getting to a time now where we may get the same amount of rain, but we get it in different amounts now. You know, we're getting like... You have the same mean, but your variance goes, you know, you're still that, that's your mean, but it's, it's way out. You know, it used to be that we would have a thunder shower every day, right? In the afternoon, and now we don't have that as much. Instead, we have these dry times and these wet times. That's nothing that rhubarb likes. Rhubarb likes good drainage, you know, so I can be learning from that, you know, and so that can happen with fruit too. We just play with it. Meanwhile, you also grow the stuff that's easy. I'm all for that, boy, you know, totally. You know, I mean, those things that just are easy to propagate. Fruit, fruit is, I, I just struggle with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. like you kind of like watch and watch and you get close and then all of a sudden it just slaps you right down mm -hmm. the ground. And you just go. Yep. Insects, disease, you name it. Yeah, yeah squirrels. I mean, the list is really long. But one thing is, you know, get a bunch, get a bunch of uh, mulberries going. You know, get some stuff going that there's so much food that all because I think it's true. Maybe I'm making it up, but I think that there's because animals have territory and they don't let that territory get too crowded. They can only eat so much of your fruit. So if you grow a whole bunch of mulberries and stuff, which they're going to prefer over the fruit that you like more because they want those seeds that are in there, the higher protein count, there's going to be fruit for you. I mean, we're totally frustrated. I got lots of elderberry flower tincture. I don't have much elderberry tincture, you know? I want to make elderberry wine. It's one of the most amazing wines I've ever tasted. We just put like 400 elderberry, elderberries out. I think we're going to get some elderberries, you know? <laughs> you are. <laughs> you know? I mean, but, you know, if you're growing four or five, you don't get very many elderberries because the birds are there before you are. I mean, they'll take them a little bit less ripe. They're there first thing in the morning. They're there in the evening, you know. But you just grow so much, you know, and that's part of it, you know. That's one way. But then there's still fungal diseases and stuff like that, and maybe we do have to spray. And, you know, we talk that better than we do here. We're, for some reason, we haven't really picked up on fruit. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe John Nelson actually did it this week. He's like, I want to spray, you know. Peace trees are in bloom, John. We need to be spraying them now, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know? But I didn't get to it. I With surrounds? No, it'd be serenade. Oh, oh yeah, for blight. Yeah, well, for, for brown rot. Right. Brown rot's oh, the big one, you know? Yeah. Maybe you try a mix. Maybe you try serenade one place and sonata someplace. But just keep trying to get fine. You know, you, want to, you got to get it when it's in flower. Because if you don't, it's just going to be there. And it's going to be there. And when's it going to show up? Right. right when you're ready to pick. You know, they all... I ended up picking most of my peaches green and made, you know, green... Yeah. Funky yeah. green peach wine. Right, yeah. Well, I just made green peach jam with right it. or chutney or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lottish, right. Yeah. I like to give it to people and then see what face they make. You know, I call it face making. You know. But another one is pawpaws, of course. They're oh, much yeah. more bulletproof. That's become a really big one. Susan Owen, who I did all the original tobacco transplant stuff with, now she's really into pawpaws. Well, and some people use the leaves as an insecticide. I mean, it's you know. They're powerful, well, you know. In Jamaica, they had this insecticide. Churchill, I got to tell you, in fact, I should have showed you some slides of this because I'm still learning. The most successful grower, he's kind of like Joe Hollis, but this guy probably has a couple hundred acres. I mean, it's, it's, he's got an amazingly huge farm. He's got big citrus groves and all this, but he sprays everything. He's got a, it's basically like an, an old Seneca apple barrel. It's one of those blue barrels. He puts breadfruit leaves in it. He puts scotch bonnet peppers in it. He takes the rinds off his oranges that he doesn't like and puts them in. And he has, he has neem trees growing, so he just throws those leaves in there. Well, he makes this brew, and then they just tilt it off. So before they tilted it off, and this is the first time in the season they're getting ready to use it, I've got pictures of it. And it's obvious that this thing is a static pile because it's got aquatic insects in it. You know what I mean? I'm like, what is this? <laughs> it's obviously got actinomycetes and stuff because the top of it has this big kind of like yeast layer on there. But they spray that stuff out and he says it just, it clears out whatever's there. I go out in his orchard and his orchard's just full of spiders everywhere. And he's got these big, they're green tanger, tangerines, they're green tangerines. They're the skin's green, but you open them up and they're bright orange. There's nothing like eating them fresh off the tree, man. Woo! So, so yeah. But we could do that. If you think about pawpaw, 
There are definitely certain trees like, oh, well, you know, back in the old days, we used to just take a cigar, right, and bust it up in water and let it soak overnight. Yeah. You just want to be careful about how strong you make that exactly. and where it lands. Where you want to get it in your eye, you know. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. it's, it's strong poison, you know. Um, but you may need to use it sometimes. What my old partner Ruth did was she had a really bad aphid infestation with lettuce in her greenhouse, and she just got a little bit of tobacco and put a dish down on the ground and lit it and let it close oh, the thing up. Out. Just oh, let yeah. that smoke spread yeah. through, boy. It's like that. It's a good lesson about why you shouldn't smoke. You know, I've done that for, you know, I had um, white-faced hornets inside the structure of my house. So they were in the walls in between. And when they, on certain nights, they just get in the mood and they come into the house, oh, yeah. you know. And so what I figured out was, you know, where's their outside hole? They're, of course, ventilating the place, right? So they're creating a draft. They're bringing air in, right? And you just find how to put that little thing of smoke right where they pull it in. And next thing you know, they are dropping out, you yeah, know, and out it takes care of them. And I don't like killing those guys, but I don't want them flying in my house with them. No, not bald face hornets. Not something that can sting you seven times. Yeah. Ow, 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 ow. <laughs> and, bite, and bite, too. Yeah. While they're stinging, bite, bite, they're, bite. They're not, they're, they're... I swell up really bad with them. Yeah, you got to watch that stuff, right? You may carry it. You want to get the plantain on them right away if you get stung oh, by one of them, right. boy. You yeah. know, and keep it, keep changing it until you're right. not hurting anymore. You know. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Just keep putting it on, <laughs> putting it on. You know. Yeah. Well, I think we've done it pretty good here. Any questions? Any questions? You know, the one thing I thought about having you do, we kept talking, so I didn't was to have you look at the um, cow pee and just say say what you see. Oh like, yeah. Just cow pee video. Out. You know, and just like, there's that, there's this. I don't know that you're going to know all of them without having to look them up, but, you know, sometime I want to have you do that. I want you to just narrate the cow pee video. I'd be glad to do that. That'd be fun. Yeah, because, I mean, a lot of the stuff, I mean, he was the one that really cracked my head way back when, when I come driving out from the NCDA, and he's just got this potato patch. It's just, like I told you, it was just flecked with all kinds of ladybugs, and I was just going, oh, my gosh, this could really work. So. And that was totally accidental. That was because... We had these kale plants that I couldn't get the chefs to take the, the tops that I love to eat, but they're slightly bitter. And they were afraid of slightly bitter, which is actually a wonderful flavor if you get into it, you know? Especially if you use the right food with it. It really is great for like high starch dishes and stuff, you know, that stands up to it. So they wouldn't use them. And so, of course, if they didn't use them, they sat there and then, of course, they get aphids. You know, you got those tips, they get aphids. And it's like, we're still getting the leaves down below. They're all on the tips and we're just picking the kale to death. Finally, it's like, okay, there's not really any leaves left to go. The tops are full of aphids. We're going to want to put a cover crop in. Nowadays, I'd let it go even longer. I'd sell the cover crop underneath. But in those days, it's like, no, we'll, we'll sell the cover crop and mow it down. And Seth, who I worked with, is like, well, should we just turn it under so we get all that nitrogen? I said, no, we want to let the, the beneficials that are bound to be there leave. And they were right next to the potato patch. Right. So we so mowed it down, and, and they just there they went. Down. And then I learned we can do that. Kenny did that. You know, you mow strategically when you need your beneficials to move where you want them to go. You know, and you don't, you know, you're gonna hurt some by mowing, but mostly they're gonna be fine, you know? And then just, they move to the next place. And then when you're done with the potatoes, you make sure there's some place next for them to go. And they just keep moving around and building and building, you know? Well, thank you guys so much. My wife has texted me that she has an emergency, but it's not life-threatening. So I think I need to talk on the phone for a minute. I heard the phone's going, blink. One of the things that Patrick has helped us to do here is I learned from him how to weave the web of life on this farm. So we've got that living web. It's resilient. It can take a hit. It yields. It gives you what you want. If you take care of it, it takes care of you. I would like to thank Patrick and everybody with Living Web Farms. Thank you guys so much for what you do. You can just see that this is a living web. There's webs all over. Look at this place. It's great. So and of course, you very much. he's our inspiration. Well, we inspire each other.